Welcome. Thanks for watching this dairy video brought to you by DairyXNet. Today, Dr. Heather Dane joins us to discuss feeding lower energy diets to transition dairy cows. For alerts on new articles, videos, and resources brought to you by DairyXNet, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter or sign up for our newsletter. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. Links to all can be found within the video's description box that you saw earlier. Today's presenter, Heather Dane, is a research scientist at the William H. Minor Agricultural Research Institute. She grew up on a dairy farm in New York where she developed a passion for dairy and an appreciation for research. She received a BS degree from Cornell University, a master's degree from Pennsylvania State University, and PhD degree from the University of Illinois. For the past 12 years, her research at the Minor Institute has focused on dairy cow nutrition and management. In addition to research activities, she is active in training and mentoring undergraduate and postgraduate students through a variety of experimental learning programs at Minor Institute. Today, Dr. Heather Jane joins us to discuss feeding lower energy diets to transition dairy cows. Thank you for the introduction. Today I will focus on feeding dry dairy cows lower energy diets. This is a management decision that can help many producers have healthier and more productive dairy cows. The nutrition and management during the dry and fresh periods dictate the success or failure of the entire lactation. And we need to focus on implementing management practices during this transition period that focus on prevention of transition disorders, optimization of nutrient intake that is driven by dry matter intake, and removal of stressors. Transition success can be defined in a number of different ways. When I talk with producers, they typically tell me they define transition success as the cow is healthy, produces a large quantity of milk with good components, and has the ability to reproduce at the appropriate time. And if these things are achieved, then the dairy is going to be profitable and sustainable. Now the question to ask is then, what are our challenges to achieving transition success? And frequently, our challenge is associated with too many health problems. We can look historically, and farms have often struggled with clinical health problems, such as mastitis, ketosis, fatty liver, and milk fever. But with implementation of management programs and improved nutritional diets, we have been able to reduce a lot of the clinical problems on well-run farms. However, today on these well-run farms, they often have issues with clinical health problems such as subclinical ketosis, hypocalcemia, or otherwise known as milk fever, and subacute rumoral acidosis. One way that we can help minimize these problems and achieve transition success is focusing on nutrition. And what we've seen over the last 10 to 20 years, based on research and field experience, is that dry cow and fresh cow nutrition continues to evolve. And is really focusing on the integration of strategies that, that focus on supporting energy, protein, and mineral, mineral metabolism along with immune function. And we can't forget the rumen function given that these cows are ruminants. Now we need to keep in mind though that the best formulated diets cannot overcome suboptimal management practices on many farms. Dry cows are housed in older facilities and may have issues with access to feed, poor cow comfort, or may be in poor repair. And so really we need to focus on, for our dry cows, implementation of management practices and facilities that allow access to good quality feed while minimizing social and environmental stressors and promoting cow comfort. The nutritional management strategy that might be used on a farm is going to be determined in part by the grouping strategy one chooses, and that is often dictated by a facility, facility design and by management ability. Shown on this slide here is a typical four-group uh, transition strategy where there's two groups during the dry period and two groups um, in early lactation. During the far-off and close-up period, cows will be often fed different diets, transition to a separate fresh diet, and then 
um, transition onto an earlier high lactating diet. Three group strategies are often used as well. And this can either be a combination of two dry cow groups and one lactating group, or a combination of a one dry cow group that is often shorter in dry period length of approximately 40 days, with those cows transitioning onto a fresh diet and then into an early lactation or high group diet. Some farms may choose because of facilities or labor issues to manage cows as a one group during the dry period and then move them directly into a one group lactating or high group diet. Now all of these strategies can be successful and they can all fail. And the one common theme to make any of these work is that we want to formulate the diets in the context of each other. And what is meant by this is that we want to make those changes in diets and nutrient supply gradual so that we don't cause any undue stress. A key question that we should ask when formulating diets is, how much TMR are the cows eating? It is a simple question and often difficult for farmers to answer, especially if they don't measure it. In addition, the dynamic nature of the close-up pen in regards to entries and exits into that pen make it difficult at times to know what the cows are actually eating. However, this is a critical component that we need to know. And the reason being is that dry matter intake is critical for success. We want to have a nice consistent intake before calving, avoid a prolonged drop in intake at calving, and then see a nice rapid and sustained increase in intake from calving until peak lactation. During the dry and lactating periods, oftentimes gut fill is going to influence intake. However, Intake can also be affected by chemostatic mechanisms, such as what can occur during the fresh period. Feed management can play a factor as far as feed availability. Social interactions when cows are overcrowded can influence their ability to consume feed, as well as environmental factors such as cold or heat stress. Now the challenge for feeding our dry cows is making sure that they consume the right amount of dry matter intake. And we have situations where cows oftentimes consume too little or too much intake, and that results in problems. If we use an example of cows that are approximately 1,500 pounds, and we look at a farm that's had low intake in the range of 26 to 28 pounds of dry matter, these animals, when they calve, often have poor starts and lower peak milk production. If this is a situation that you're dealing with, then some potential actions to be taken include testing feed quality and looking at digestibility. Maybe something has changed in recent times. We want to evaluate bunk management and making sure that feed is available. And then we also want to assess non-nutritional stressors. Are the cows overcrowded? Has there been an unexpected heat or cold stress event that has occurred? And there's a number of other non-nutritional stressors that may be in play. Some farms have the opposite problem. The cows consume too much energy, and this is very easy to do on some of our typical close-up uh, diets. These cows consume oftentimes more than 33 pounds of dry matter intake, and before calving, you may see increases in body weight and body condition score gain that's a beyond what we would desire. After calving, cows may have sluggish intake and they may also have excessive body weight and body condition score loss. If this is a problem that you're dealing with or experiencing, then some potential actions include limiting the grain type forages like corn silage and other palatable feeds to control intake. Many may look to complement existing diets with a consistent low potassium bulky forage source. Oftentimes straw or hay is used in this role. Carbohydrates are a key area that we need to focus on when formulating diets for dry cows as well as lactating cows. And this is because they provide the majority of energy that the animal gains. Steam up diets that have been fed over the last couple of decades have failed to consistently minimize health problems and help farms achieve transition success in both research trials and field experience. Because of that, we've gone back to reevaluating how we feed dry cows and implementation of higher forage dry diets to help control intake has been achieved. Cows, when they've consumed steam up diets or even some of our more modern uh, moderate energy diets, it's very easy for cows to consume 150 to 180% of their energy requirements. And so we 
basically try to implement a solution to allow cows to not overconsume energy. And we do this by formulating diets of relatively low energy density that allow the cows to consume free choice diet without greatly exceeding her daily energy requirement. And so we try to meet 100 to about 110% of her metabolizable energy requirement. Now I'm not advocating to limit energy intake to cows less than the requirements, but rather to feed them a bulky diet that will only meet the requirements when they consume all that they can eat. We know that prolonged overconsumption of energy during the dry period can result in poorer transition. Lots of research is, along with field experience have shown that overfed cows during the dry period, and this can be either the far off or close up period, can contribute to increased abdominal fat deposition. That that can lead to and relate to insulin resistance, increase the amount of blood non-esterified fatty acid and beta hydroxybutyrate um, as a response to increased fat mobilization after calving. These can contribute to higher levels of fat or triglyceride in the liver. In the visual sign that you'll see on the farm is increased body weight and body condition score loss after calving. When these things occur, they all contribute to chronic inflammation that we know is highly tied into metabolism and ultimately the cow will experience more health problems. And because of these changes, cows will have lower levels of dry matter and energy intake, less milk production, and when the time is right, have more difficulty reproducing. And ultimately, these contribute to lower profitability on the farm. So one solution is the implementation of higher forage, lower energy, dry diets. They're also known as controlled energy diets, Goldilocks diets, or when, they don't, when things don't go well, the bleep bleep straw diet. Now the goal here is to feed the cows to meet their energy requirements along with meeting other nutrient requirements. We want to make sure that we feed just the right amount, not too much and not too little. And if we do those things, we're able to promote a consistent intake throughout the dry period. And because of that, it will promote a high intake after calving. One of the things we need to keep in mind as we implement this nutritional strategy is that it's not just a close-up or pre-fresh strategy. We need to implement it during the far-off period or in a one-group situation, start it when the cows are dried off. This is because if we delay too long, dry matter intake um, will decrease in the close-up period when we implement these bulky diets. And this is at a time period where we don't want the cow to decrease their intake for any reason. These higher forage, lower energy diets are often based on corn silage and straw or hay. And the combination of corn silage and straw works extremely well because of the characteristics of those feeds. Typically, we're formulating diets to be approximately 100 to 110 percent of the metabolizable energy needs of the animal. And from a carbohydrate standpoint, this often results in diets containing 12 to 18 percent starch and over 40 percent NDF. Oftentimes the NDF is much higher and we're basically formulating diets to reach cow's gut fill capacity, which limits dry matter intake and allows us to control energy intake. The metabolizable protein supply of the cows will oftentimes be between 1,000 and 1,300 grams per day or uh, expressed differently as 80 to 100 grams of MP per kilogram of dry matter. Field observations and some research has suggested that feeding higher levels of protein during this um, implementation of the lower energy, lower starch diets is beneficial because it provides additional amino acids post that may be limited with less microbial protein production with a lower starch diet. These diets can be fine-tuned based on fermentable carbohydrates. In particular, we want to pay attention to the digestibility of the feeds and forages and we also want to fine tune these diets uh, based on the cow response. So the nutrient density may be adjusted based on the cow's or the pen of cow's actual intake, the health response, and the performance of those animals after calving. These higher forage, lower energy diets must be fed as TMR. And these diets shouldn't be considered a lazy or easy way to implement feeding cows. It does require a high level of feeding management. 
in situations where people have chose to offer uh, free choice low energy forage such as straw or hay with this with a partial mixed TMR, it actually ends up being difficult for the cows to consume the proper amount of energy. Because just like when I go to a buffet, if a cow is allowed to choose, they may not choose the best foods to support their health and ultimately their performance. Straw is one of the key components to being able to implement lower energy diets as well as hay can be used. But oftentimes straw in particular, wheat straw, is used because it's plentiful, uniform in quality, and typically palatable. And it promotes a desired rumen fermentation conditions that is complementary to the corn silage. We typically think of straw as low quality because of its digestibility, but in this particular role, it actually is a high quality or important forage that we utilize. You need to consider some other quality indicators as well, and palatability is key, along with making sure the straw is free of contaminants and molds. And once that's identified, we want to have a nice consistent source that we're able to provide a consistent particle size in the diet. Particle size is critical for implementing these diets. And one tool that we can assess particle size is through the use of the Penn State Particle Separator. Straw or hay should be processed. And a guideline to minimize sorting uh, from TMR throughout the day and having refusals that are similar to what was offered is making sure that straw or hay has a distribution of particle sizes from largest to smallest of 20, 40, 20, and 20. If one is using an older Penn State particle separator, then a nice, easy thumb rule to remember is making sure that the distribution is a third, a third, and a third on all three sieves. Or for those that don't have access to a Penn State particle separator, typically we want to see that straw or hay chopped to less than two inches in width. The most common way that I see cows consume too much energy on properly formulated diets is by not processing the straw or hay appropriately. Some examples are shown in the photos. You can see that there's clear circles uh, in the feed bunk indicating that the cows have been sorting. And so this is one of our biggest challenges to implementing these higher forage diets is making sure we take the time to appropriately process that straw and hay. Sorting is a key management item that needs to be addressed when implementing these diets. This can be done through evaluating the TMR at feed out and throughout the day along with refusals the next day. We can do that visually as assessed in the, the previous slide. We can also use the Penn State particle separator and we want to see a difference of less than 10 to 15 percent between TMR and refusals. We can also use chemical composition, in particular NDF and crude protein, with a desired difference less than 10%. It always pays to look at the cows, and so we're basically looking at cows to evaluate them for change in variation during the dry period. And oftentimes, body condition score has been our main variable that we've looked at. However, as we've done a better job at decreasing body condition, we don't always see those changes in body condition in the short-term nature that we would indicate would be a problem. And so body weight can become a useful measure. The reason that I indicate that body condition may not always tell the entire story is that if we look at some research comparing moderate energy shown in the blue compared to lower energy diets shown in the red across the range of body condition scores for the cows, we see that that Thin cows accumulate internal body fat that isn't obvious when body condition scoring them. And so basically what this means is that cows that are thin may behave metabolically as if they were fat over conditioned cows. And so we now need to go beyond just body condition score to assess their health risk. And this is where monitoring body weight can be beneficial. And looking at changes in body weight from dry off to close up to immediately after they calve we can fine-tune rations and management and identify opportunities or potential train wrecks before they occur based on body weight change that occurs during the dry period. Now, one of the key questions that we need to keep in mind, given that we want to formulate diets in the context of one another during this transition period, is how should we transition cows from a higher forage, lower energy dry diet to a lactating diet? 
And the simple answer is that we want to use a fresh and high diet work best. In general, the fresh cow diet is frequently based on the, how, the high cow diet, and we also want to make sure we're taking into account how we fed those cows during the dry period, especially as we transition from these lower for, higher forage, lower energy diets. Some of the common adjustments that are made are feeding less starch and more fiber than what was in the than what will be in the high cow diet, and this amount will be adjusted based on how we fed the dry period diet. So for example, lower starch diets during the dry period will do, cows will do better when they're fed a lower starch diet during the fresh period potentially, depending on the other combinations of fermentable carbohydrates. We also want to consider the physically effective fiber component of the diet. This fresh diet will typically contain a little less physically effective fiber than the high diet, but we do include oftentimes up to two pounds of chopped straw or hay to make that transition from these high bulky straw diets into the high group diet nice and smooth. In addition to focusing on carbohydrate fractions, we'll also uh, adjust the protein fractions, uh, look at the amount of fat that we provide, and then at times use strategic addition of other nutrients and additives. The goal really as we formulate this fresh diet is to help that cow transition from the dry period diet to the high group diet by promoting rumen function and a rapid rise in intake with the goals of minimizing sera and chronic inflammation. There are several take home messages for today's presentation. The first being that higher forage, lower energy diets fed during the dry period can help cows achieve transition success. We need to keep in mind though that diet is only part of the key part of the uh, solution to success. We need to make sure we minimize stressors at the same time. And these stressors can be feeding management related, social stressors, or environmental stressors. As we implement these diets, we want to make sure that we meet all the nutrient requirements of the cow while not greatly exceeding her requirement for energy. The diets are often based on corn silage and straw. How can higher forage, lower energy diets improve transition success? Essentially, these diets are going to help stabilize dry matter intake and prevent large drops in dry matter intake before calving. They can help prevent fat cow type responses to excessive energy consumption. And so we see less insulin resistance, fatty liver, and ketosis and other related health problems. With the use of straw or other low potassium forages in these type of diets, we're able to decrease potassium intake during the close-up period, thereby affecting the decad level of the diet and preventing low blood calcium after the cow calves. In addition, we can increase dry matter intake after calving along with improved rumen fill and function. And this ultimately decreases the risk of displaced abomasums and acidosis. Attention to feeding management is critical for transition success. We need to make sure that we measure dry matter intake along with testing feeds and particular forages to make sure that we're providing the right amount of fermentable carbohydrates and energy to these animals. We want to feed the diets as a TMR starting at dry off. And one of the key problems is not incorporating the properly processed straw or hay. So that's a critical component that those are chopped or processed in some way to the correct particle size. We want to monitor sorting and then ultimately use a fresh cow diet, especially with a one group dry cow diet to allow those cows to transition smoothly. So thank you for your attention and have a great day.